We finally got him in the studio. The one and only David Guetta is here. David, how are you? I'm good. I'm happy to be with you. I'm very, very happy that we're finally getting the chance to do this because nice. let's be honest, you know, we could just have a little quick chat, but we thought we might as well give you an entire show. Wow, fantastic. I'm very <laughs> honoured. Because <laughs> it's impossible to sum up your career in just a few conversations, in just a, a very short period of time, because you are one of those people who... As dance music has evolved, you've been one of the key players in helping dance music to evolve to what it is now. But I want to take you all the way back. Where did you first get into music? I'm going to sound like a dinosaur now, but I've been a DJ for more than 40 years. It wow. sounds completely crazy, but I started to really DJ, um, like, I mean, playing for people when I was 14. And um, it was in the 80s. So I, I, was, uh, I started with playing funk and disco. And um, which was not necessarily, uh, especially in France, it was a little more like a ghetto kind of music, you know, mm -hmm. because the mainstream would be more uh, variety and uh, rock. And this is what people were listening and this is what was on the radio. And then, you know, um, there was some DJs, it was the beginning of pirate radios and they were playing funk and I was like, wow, this is amazing, you know? And uh, so that's what I started to play. And this was the foundation of uh, house music, mm. you know. Um, and actually a lot of those records um, that were being played at, uh, you know, the Paradise Garage or, or, or uh, the Warehouse, but I didn't even know that because I, <laughs> I didn't know of the existence of, of those clubs. And, um, and funny enough, um, uh, the first job I got uh, in a club is when I was uh, 17 I was hired in a gay club this was probably the biggest blessing of my life because then I was curious and I what's happening in America in the gay clubs and I heard at that time of what was going on in Chicago of house music mm -hmm. all of this and I started in 88 the first um, house music residency uh, every Monday and I was playing Acid House. And it's really crazy because at the time, um, it was just me and Laurent Garnier. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, DJing actually at the Hacienda here in the UK. He was. And he would, he would be coming once a month, or maybe once every two months, uh, playing uh, techno. And me, I was housier, you know? So this is how uh, it started for me. And, and really because my music was standing out mm -hmm. from that point. Um, and all of this was because of playing in a gay club. Because a, a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, house music, you know this, but was born in, in black gay clubs uh, in America. And then um, when it started to be successful in, in Europe at the beginning, it was a lot in gay clubs too. Mm -hmm. So... The only way you could play house music really was playing gay parties, which is what I was doing for years. And I remember that my favorite record from that time in 88 was Move Your Body uh, by Marshall Jefferson. Oh, now that is a proper classic. What was the Parisian scene like at that time for the music that you were playing? So first, there was no scene. Honestly, it's what I was telling you, like you would hear the Rolling Stones in clubs. Really? Yeah, really. Me, I was like, you know, playing hip-hop, playing house, and but I would be an alien, you know, soul to soul, all, all of those records. And, uh, and it was really like people were looking at me and I, I remember this show that I did. Um, it was, in, imagine, it was in 88 and I was playing in a club called Les Bandouche and I was playing with a TB303 and a sampler. And people had no idea what I was doing. And, you know, like, the, 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 the guy that was the director of the club loved it and thought it was very interesting, but sometimes was, like, telling me, you know, you, you need to tune it down a little bit because it's a little bit too strange. But wow. they got to know me thanks to that original gay club where I was playing because there I could do anything I wanted. Yeah. And, and because they were... So it was also the time of Boy London, you know, all that trend. It was so big. This is when I was really, really playing house music. And it was underground, not because I wanted to be underground, just because it was, yeah. you know. And it's, it's very funny because, like, I think today uh, DJs 
it's like a decision. Do you want to be an underground DJ or do you want to be crossing over? Whereas at the time, I was in this underground scene, but we didn't have a choice. Yeah, it, it, I wanted it to be bigger always because I thought this is the best music. Everyone should listen to this. It was just not possible, right. you know. And 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 I remember that the the you know the the club owners would not let me play this music. So the way I started it is um, the club where I was playing. It was really dead on Monday. There was no one there. So I told the guy, look, I want to propose you something as I was like a normal resident DJ. You know, I was playing yeah. eight hours a day like a normal employee. And I was like, look, Monday is empty. I'm going to make flyers. I'm going to take care of the promotion. You don't need to pay me extra. Just let me play the music I want to play. Wow. And so I went to London. I bought every house music record I could buy at the time, <laughs> I didn't even have time to listen. Wow. I just gave all the money I had and, and told the guy, look, I'm starting a house music party in Paris. Like at the time we called it Acid House. Uh, please give me all the biggest records. And this is when it started for me that I really stood out because it, I was my sound was so different from every other DJ. And then later on, I started to make music myself And I came with just a little more love. And Wally Lopez gave me an amazing remix. And I think this was probably 2002 or three. Yeah. And and um, I remember going to space um, and it was before internet. So I'm going to space and, and I had no idea that the record was uh, the Ibiza anthem of that summer. <laughs> and I didn't know because of no internet. Yeah. So... He's playing the record and telling my name. I will never forget this. And telling my name on the microphone. And everyone at Space is playing, is singing the song. And I was in shock. And you, you didn't know? know that this was happening at all? I had no idea it was a hit. No idea. Wow. And, and, and this was like one of the most magic moments of my entire life. I'll never forget. See, the good thing that I love about Just A Little More Love is that the original version it speaks to your funk and your kind of your disco background because it's a little bit more electro. It's a little bit yeah, more 80s vibe. El Nair Fish, which was a electro hip hop, early, uh, you know, early electro hip hop record like that 808 type of uh, drums and uh, uh, vocoders. And yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is, it, it's interesting. And also that's why it was a little bit like f kind of French You know, uh, and, and <laughs> you've got a style. Yeah, There's a it was, French uh, style. It was a little bit different. Yes, and, and um, I remember playing this record to Thomas from Daft Punk, and uh, he was very impressed. And he was like God for me. You know, it's like and still <laughs> today actually mm. it didn't change. I remember he came to um, my small, small uh, studio, very small, and uh, he was listening to the record in a loop on the session, you know, and it's like, wow, this is really, really good, like really good. And uh, he's done something that I've never seen before. I still remember he put the level very, very low and went to uh, the other room. Uh, and I was like, what is this? And actually, you know, this is a way to see if the vocals are standing out in a correct way in the mix. And then he called Virgin, that was you know, the coolest uh, uh, label at the time where they had Air, they had like Daft Punk and Cassius and they say, and, and said like, look, my friend made a good record, you should listen to it. <laughs> and it was like God calling, you know, so of course I was signed the day after. <laughs> so that's the story. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, that's the story. And then the Wally Lopez remix turns it into an Ibiza anthem. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. I mean, obviously, Thomas, is, is, he's supported you, but what, what were your family's thoughts when you were a teenager DJ? Oh, they were going nuts. I, I, my, my, my father still jokes about um, when I was training uh, and mixing uh, in deep uh, last night, a DJ saved my life. But, you know, 
again, there was no tutorial. No. You need to understand just the concept of changing the speed of a record to beat match. It was hard to understand it because I couldn't go to a club and see other DJs do that. Because you're 14. Exactly. <laughs> I was even 12. Wow. So I had to figure it out myself. But to do that, I had to play those records thousands of time and my dad was going nuts and he's still joking about it blaming me for driving everyone crazy in the neighborhood yeah I'm sure he's forgiven you by now yeah yeah of course of course it's, yeah my family's happy now <laughs> all of those years of him driving you crazy look at it look at it yeah yeah they deserve a treat though because <laughs> you know like when you start when you learn how to beat match it's not the most pleasant for the neighbors no it isn't but look at where it's got you yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, so the Wally Lopez remix of Just a Little More Love was a big Ibiza anthem. Was that the first time that you went to Ibiza? No, no, no. I was in Ibiza before, but, you know, I would go to David Morales, Frankie Knuckles, uh, Danny Tenaglia, and I would book those guys, by the way. What's very funny is that Marriott, that is still my agent today, was uh, the agent of Death Mix, and um, I was playing a club in Paris called Queen, and I came with a concept that was completely new in France, funny enough, that was to invite international DJ. And the owner was like, huh? Why would I pay 10,000 francs? So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> imagine, it's like, it's like $3,000 uh, to fly David Morales or Frankie Knuckles when the club is full anyway. Are you crazy? Because at the time, time we would get paid like I don't know like a hundred or two hundred you know yeah and it was really like trying to educate the crowd it was not to bring people because you know now the industry it's different it's yeah. an industry yeah. like okay the promoter is like I'm gonna book this DJ paying this amount but I'm gonna generate this amount of tickets so it's a good business this is how it's done it's not necessarily out of passion for this music yeah. whereas at the time I was not bringing DJs to generate more income it was just because they were playing a music that no one else could play. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share that with the world and, I mean, with, with Paris at least. And also, it was the opportunity for me to ask them questions. Like, <laughs> you know, like, what synths are you using? Like, how do you do that, you know? You, I were, remember, getting, you were getting the club to pay for you to do your homework. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Because now, you know, you go to tutorial on, 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 on YouTube and it's so easy. You can know every every cent of, of uh, uh, every producer, you know, yeah. it's very easy. But at that time, it wasn't. I couldn't understand how it was done. So, so yeah, yeah, this is, this is really the beginning. I remember there was a moment, I think it's around 2003, 2004, there was like DJ Hell and uh, this electro, electro clash yes. kind of vibe. And I was influenced by this and also took a disco. And um, I came with Love Don't Let Me Go, David Guetta versus The Egg, and it was that electro sound, but with, you know, a real song. Yes. And I think if we look at my entire career, my trick is always kind of the same. It's like, what's hot in the underground? Let's take those sonics, but write a real song on the top of it. Mm. And, and that's what I've done. And this is how I got my first number one in the UK, I remember. I remember this record coming out and everybody doing the whole, what is that? Because we, we've obviously, we've heard the underground stuff. We've heard the Electro Clash stuff. Then there's a, a record with a song over the top. A song that yeah. your mum can sing. But you're going, but this is club music. But it works. So imagine at the time uh, I'm signed to Virgin Record in France. Yeah. And the first version I made of, of Love Don't Let Me Go uh, went to number one in France, but it was impossible for me to be successful out of France. And I was so frustrated. And then when I came with this electro version, I went to the UK and uh, I tried to have them to release it because friends wouldn't release it as they said we already just had a number one we cannot release yeah. a new version yeah. and I remember the guy saying like uh, 
Dance music and guitars together. Ha ha ha. Sorry, no. <laughs> I will never forget that. And, uh, you know, like uh, very looking down on me. And I was like, okay. Then I'm back to, the, to, 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 to France. I'm telling the guy, listen, I am a DJ. I'm playing. I'm telling you this is a hit. It's like, no, I'm sorry, David. We can't release it. I said, would you mind if I take the record and I put it out as an independent. And imagine, they own the record yeah. worldwide. And then I go to each independent label and together with my, my actually my new UK manager at the time, Caroline Protero, and, and we sign the record country per country. Uh, in the UK, it was Ministry of Sound, and we go to number one everywhere. <laughs> And imagine how crazy the label owned that record, but they don't. No. Because that version is mine. <laughs> It's like a crazy story. That is hilarious. And this is like the whole Electro House wave. Yeah. What was it like DJing that vibe at that time? There was a, a level of energy in Electro that I've never witnessed in, in, you know, house was more like being cool and sexy. Yeah. And then I could see almost that, not the rave energy, but close in clubs. And to, to feel this for the first time, because I, at that time, I would not touch trance. Like this was like, a, you know, it, it was a It's different time. Yeah. It, was a, it was a different time. It was almost like a war between trends. There was, and people don't remember this. Yeah, no, because now everything is more open. Yes. Thank, it's, it's actually amazing. But, you know, at the time, if you were trans or house, you were enemies, yeah. you know. So, so me at the time, I wouldn't touch trends, even though I liked it secretly. But <laughs> you wouldn't tell I, anyone. <laughs> no, it, 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 was, it was impossible in my scene. I've got to take you to the, your start of, of, of your residency in Ibiza because, I mean, you know, this year it, it has been Future Rave at high and it, it's just been every week completely sold out, in advance completely sold out. The club room was full for years and years and years of just having the number one night in Ibiza. Where did that all come from? Where did that all start? Pepe, the owner of Space, came to Paris to my club, heard me play, and um, that's why I'm still very grateful. And even though my name was meaningless, uh, he, he thought that was great, and he invited me to play. And that was, yeah, I think, 96. But then, that day, Unfortunately, it was raining. And also, there was police everywhere around the club controlling people, which for an after party is not the best. Right. And it was absolutely empty. It was like, really, it, it, I was so sad. It was terrible. So I still played. And it was like, don't worry, you know, it's your first time. The music was amazing. The few people that were there were so cool. Um, I want to book you again next year. And next year, I don't know, I felt like it was the beginning of French Touch. It yes. was 97. And I felt more strong, you know, because imagine at that time I was doing my own promotion. People almost would laugh at me when I say I'm a French DJ because French, it was nothing. It was not even on the map. Mm. And then 97 comes And I say, you know what? I'm going to play space, but I'm also going to take over Privilege because I'm bringing Daft Punk. And Daft Punk came with homework in 97 and no one knew them, but everyone knew uh, around the world. So I was walking with my team and giving flyers on the beach all day, playing around the world on a ghetto blaster and telling everyone, The name is Daft Punk and they're playing with me at Privilege. So from that time, they started to take us seriously. <laughs> <laughs> from that point onwards, we know what we're talking about. Exactly. After that, I came with the FMM Famous concept. Yes. And, you know, um, playing Pacha for years and started to be very, very successful because my approach was a little bit sexier and different and um, Ibiza really is a turning point in my career for sure. I remember the very first time I went to Ibiza 2006 as I got off the plane the first thing that I saw was you 
on a huge billboard. Yeah, yeah, of course. F M I F everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It was the biggest party on the island, and um, I was also playing Manu Mission. Yes, that was like incredible, incredible party at, at Privilege from uh, two British guys, uh, like a British couple. Mike um, and Claire. Um, yeah, Mike and Claire, exactly. <laughs> yeah, amazing, amazing memories. Give me one other French touch record that you adore from that period. Feeling for you from Cassius? Yeah. Perfect. Incredible. Because this is the point where for me, I'm like, I want to be French. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, it was crazy at the time because you would have fake French labels in the UK. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> People pretending they were French. I know. Unbelievable. Stuart Price, who went on to produce Madonna, he had a project called Le Rhythm Digital. But of course, I remember. <laughs> and his, his, his French name was not broadcastable. <laughs> Yeah, Jacques yeah. Lecoq. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. From one day to the other, we became like the coolest people on the planet. Um, just for a small moment. <laughs> no, 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 it stayed forever. It stayed forever. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, those people were so amazing. Cassius, Daft Punk, uh, Air, unbelievable. And, um, and at the same time, there was Chemical Brothers, there was Prodigy, yes. there was Faceless. You know, it was such an incredible moment. And those records really influenced me later for Future Rave. A big, big influence. If we listen to, to Hey Boy, Hey Girl, for example, a lot of the synth and, and melodic tricks that they're using is uh, the foundation of what I've used later to create Future Rave, like semitones, uh, uh, lead synths that are a little bit like... Uh, you know, not totally in tune, but but in tune enough to feel yeah. right. Yeah. Everything was mixed. Like it was dance music with a rock approach. Mm -hmm. And I think this was very, very new to have a rock star approach in dance music. I remember visiting Daft Punk for the first time when I played them uh, um, Just a Little More Love. I went to the studio and my expectation was because they, I knew they were from a good family and they were from a good neighborhood. Yeah. So I was like, oh yeah, they sound so amazing because of course they, they're producing with a, you know, a amazing studio. They have an SSL, equipment. you know? Yeah. And then I came and I'm like, where's the studio? And they're like, this is our studio. And it was a ghetto blaster. This is how, and two small Mackie mixes, eight tracks chained and they had only, um, I remember everything, a DP4 for the, for the, uh, the effects and one compressor that was on the master, but not, ma not compressing each track. So they had nothing. And I was like, did you do homework with that? And they're like, yeah. No, no, come on. Then I remember being completely depressed. <laughs> Coming home like, I suck. I have no <laughs> talent. Because of course, you know, you're always taking excuses. Yeah. You know, and my excuse is that they had money and they had a huge studio. But then when I realized that it was not true at all, I felt so bad, oh, man. you know, and it was just, okay, undeniable talent. We've, we've, we've had French touch. We've had just a little more love. And then musically, you take all of your influences and you change the game again. And I started to do, you know, um, When Love Takes Over, Kelly Rowland. Uh, she's the first one that gave me a chance. Really? She was, yeah, she's the first famous artist. Uh, she came to me when I was playing a show in Cannes, I remember, in the south of France. And I, was, I played the instrumental of When Love Takes Over. And she said, like, came to me and, like, what is this record? I said, well, it's... It's an instrumental I made, you know. And she, she told me, like, could you give it to me? And I, I can I write something on it? And um, crazy enough, they went to the studio with Nerval, the two sisters. Really? And they wrote together When Love Takes Over. Wow. Absolutely. Before Nerval were DJs. When I heard that, I, was, I went crazy. And I remember playing this record in all my shows and emptying my dance floor every time. That was the response first time? Terrible. Really? Because it was too different. Yeah. You know, 
Um, in hindsight, yeah. Because <laughs> it, it's it, it was it was like a pop piano with like house drums and a kind of urban pop melody. What is this? You know, and and after two months of emptying my dance floor every night, this record exploded and became huge. And from that, then almost in the in the four months that came, I got a fitting for Black Eyed Peas. I did Memories and 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 Sexy Chick and When Love Takes Over. And I think those records they completely changed the game. Um, I got so much hate at that time because again, you know, I was part of a tribe which was the House Tribe, and it was like. I betrayed them mm. because they saw this as being a sellout. When it was just like me doing what I love and saying I refuse to respect the, those rules uh, because you know, okay, if you if you make house music, you need to work with uh, Justin Brown and Martha yeah. Walsh and Barbara Tucker, which I love. But you know. I also love Akon. I also love, you know, uh, Destiny Child. And, yeah. and, you know, so... And if you ask them who they love, they'll go, Jocelyn Brown, yeah, Barbara Tucker. Yeah, exactly, you know. So I got so much hate for that. But this is also what defined really my career mm. because, you know, it became what the 10 next years of dance music were going to be. Um, and... Uh, also, it was very interesting because house music was born in the U.S., was became trendy thanks to the U.K. and thanks to Europe, but always stayed underground mm. uh, in the U.S. And then at that time, all the radios are starting to play my records. And there's also Lady Gaga at the same time, which also helped a lot. And it's that big EDM wave, it's like Swedish House Mafia. I remember because I was a massive fan. I was booking them before they were they were how, uh, Swedish House Mafia. They were yeah. playing uh, "F Me I'm Famous" in Ibiza with me, and I was a massive, massive fan of them. Of Egg Prids, I, 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 we were very good friends. We were exchanging records, and we're still very good friends actually. And I remember when they came with one, and this was like. A punch, like I, I was knocked out. I was so, so obsessed the with first, that record. The first time you heard it, you're like, "But these are the guys that I book." How? But, but no, what, but really, like honestly, they put me to sleep with that record. <laughs> you know, really, like I'm honest. You know, like it was really. It felt like wow. That was, I think, after Titanium, even because imagine, like I was like coming from all those urban pop crossover then I changed the game again with Titanium with yes. Sia yes um, and, uh, and 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 then those guys they came with that and I was like wow you know and that moment you know it was a little bit like the golden era of EDM I would say that yeah. EDM was was so huge but at a very high level of quality because it was really like me and them, and then Avicii came with Levels. Yes. Also an amazing, amazing record. And this guy, he was, he was such um, a beautiful person, but like a genius on the keyboard. And we were all more like focused on production, I remember. And he was like, I'm just going to use all the sonics of Nexus. I don't care. I have no time to, to waste on that. You know, uh, use simple sounds. But his music was so undeniable mm. that we all stayed quiet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you know, because it's like crazy. And, and and we became good friends. And I remember being in the studio, we did um we did a few records together, uh, and he helped me finish Lovers on the Sun. I remember I had that song. And we were very good friends because he, he, he came to me to play his album when he did um, Wake Me Up and, and, and all those records. Um, uh, and I remember when I heard this, I'm like, I told him, like, you're going to become bigger than me. That's it. And he was like, nah, come on. I'm like, I'm telling you, this is, <laughs> this is insane. Like, you know, this is going to change everything. And, um, 
and and it did, you know. So yeah. I I think that era was so so incredible. I didn't feel like this since probably Bob Sinclair and Love Generation. That was also another alien. Yeah, you know. I heard uh, World Hold On is my favorite, but it's still house music. It's still a house record, yeah. But Love Generation is like. Where is this coming from? It's reggae, it's rock, yeah, it's house. It's, 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 it's... It was such an <laughs> alien record, you know? <laughs> so the same way when I heard Wake Me Up, I was like, where is this coming from? How mm. did you think of that? And funny enough, the same way I got so much hate when I started to work a few years before with urban artists, he got so much hate Like, no one speaks about this anymore. No. But when he performed Wake Me Up uh, uh, at, Ultra at Ultra in Miami, people were booing. And it was not easy, but he was so brave. You know, he yeah. embraced it. And then he changed the game the same way I did before. You know, so uh, this shows that, you know, every time you're a little bit out of the box, you create a lot of hate, but also a lot of passion yeah. and and this is how things evolve and change we can't go any further though without talking a little bit more about titanium oh yeah because that record i've been at school events with my children and the kids are singing titanium that record is one of those songs that people have had it at their funerals people have had it at their weddings what was making that record like it's probably The record I'm the most proud of in my entire career is one of the biggest I, uh, I've ever made. But at the time, we had no idea it was a hit. Mm. I just knew that I loved it. And imagine, on the album, it came at single number seven. <laughs> And you know, at the time, you would release the big hits first. Yeah. So this shows that we didn't know. It was so big. Uh, see, I was not famous at the time. Mm. She was doing a few indie projects uh, in Australia and also in the UK. And by that time, I'm working as a producer, her as a writer. And I'm like, listen, this record is too big. I cannot give it away to another artist. I want to keep it, but also no one is going to sound like you. It's impossible. Funny enough, Katy Perry reminded me that I sent her the record and she turned it down. <laughs> Crazy, so, right? So Katy Perry could have been on Titanium. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. And she turned it down. <laughs> and it, it, Talk it, about regrets. And she told me. She, it, <laughs> I, I actually forgot. Um, and, and, you know, at that time, I'm begging Sia to stay on the record because I know that no one is going to sound like her. Mm. And at that time she decided to stop being an artist because she just wanted to be a songwriter. She was suffering from anxiety and she didn't want to be on stage. Uh, I don't need to explain you, but you know, the traveling a lot, being on stage, the, the fear you can get of rejection, uh, the stress of interviews, all of that. And I'm telling you like, okay, what would it take for you to make one last record as an artist? She's like, okay, I'll do it, but no promotion, no video, no concerts, and this will be my last record as an artist. Imagine. <laughs> Crazy. Wow. And this record changed my life, changed her life, and from that, I would be in the studio and her receiving messages from Rihanna and Beyonce fighting for the songs. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> and we're like... What? What is happening? This is insane. And I remember meeting Calvin Harris. He's really what, like one of my favorite producers ever. And um, and we would be talking, and it would be I would be like, so how do you see your career? It's like I just want to make a record like Titanium, <laughs> which it, obviously it did like many times, but not at that time. You know, yeah. it was like a point of reference. And um, and it's funny because later it came with a. We fell in love with Rihanna, and that, that to me is like one of the most incredible uh, dance records um, ever. It brings us quite close to the present day. I have to say, we're talking about the EDM era. And then, you know, EDM became so big, 
And with success comes always a lot of imitations mm -hmm. and a lot of downgrading. And then came a moment that was very difficult for me as a DJ um, where everyone was sounding exactly the same, where, you know, there was, um, uh, you know, uh, at the time also I made a record with Showtech that was uh, called Bad. To do that sound, we needed to play in F minor because it, the bass sounded good that way. And it was completely insane. You would play a festival and every DJ would play only in F minor yeah. and, and the same kick and the same lead sound from Nexus. And I would, I would go absolutely crazy, but every time I would try something different, people would leave the dance floor. And it was really probably the least happy moment of my career as a DJ because I was not in tune with what I was playing anymore. I was tired of that sound. And then came the idea for me of creating Jackback because I was miserable. And I was like, you know what? I want to come back um, to the original passion I had for house music. And at the time, I remember there was Camel Fat and there was Solardo. And one day, I meet Solardo because something happened to them and they're asking me, can we jump on your plane to go to Ibiza or UK? I don't remember. And they start to play the music they're making. And I'm like, I, I know, know this. I know this. <laughs> this is, I can do that. Like, you know, this is how I started. Like, you guys are playing what I was doing when I started. And, um, And then this is what gave me the idea of starting Jackback. Mm. And they very nicely invited me to play with them, um, I remember, in, in Ibiza. And uh, this is when I started Jackback and uh, I had uh, this first release on Defected um, with Sometimes. See, I remember when this came out and... It blew so many people's minds that had only really got into your music around Titanium that what David Guetta's got an alias and he's making this. But for people like me, it's like, yeah, he's come back. He's yeah, come back. Yeah. Even the name Jack back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Going back to Jack. Jack exactly. your body. <laughs> exactly. So so yeah, because you know, at the very, very early beginning of Acid House, everything was about like Jack, 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 Jack your body. It, it was like the kind of the secret code of, of Acid House, you know. So it was, um, at the time, we were very good friends with uh, Felix the House Cat. Um, and he was like fully Electro Clash and, and, uh, and I was Electro House. And, but we, we would hang out and, and have fun. And, and um, we were talking about this, about, you know, the original Acid House, always saying this, like, Jack is back, Jack is back. And, and I'm like, oh, Jack is back. Well, wait. And first I made a record that was not under my name called Jack is back. It was an acid house record that I sent to Justice and Daft Punk and Cassius and all. And they all started to play it without knowing it was me. <laughs> and, uh, and it was like so funny. The record became very big in the underground. And then I was like, Yo, guys, just wanted to let you know you're playing David Guetta. It was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. And then I kind of went back to my roots uh, and uh, and did Sometimes. Sometimes is an amazing record. And Jack Back as an alias, I feel like, you know, you, you've, you've put out some great records underneath that alias. But the thing that I love that you do right now is that everything is David Guetta. Everything that you do is under your name. It's not necessarily having to have an alias because you've earned the right to do what you want to do in the way that you do it. Yeah, I, 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 I want to be like this, um, but I'm, I'm realizing that those side projects, sometimes they help me avoid a misunderstanding. Mm. The problem I'm having with David Guetta is people are expecting a huge success. So when I do a Jackback record or a Future Rave record, I do this for the party people. I do this for the DJs. I do this for the ravers. But some people will say, oh, it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, David Guetta made a record and it wasn't successful. And it's mm -hmm. not that it's not successful. It's that the goal is not the same. So sometimes using those aliases helps me explaining to people what positioning it is. Yes. 
And oh, actually, I could give you an exclusive because I met a, uh, I'm, uh, after you know uh, doing all those huge records that that I'm, I've been doing lately and uh, uh, doing Future Rave. I thought it's a long time that I'm not using the Jackback alias. And I have a remix of Dennis Fair, Hey Hey. And uh, it's going to be released soon on Defected. Ooh, ooh, so ooh. let me give it to you and that would be an exclusive. I'm for ready you. for that. Let's do that. <laughs> so the thing is, David, is that you are someone who has always had his finger on the pulse of underground dance music at the same time as driving it forward within the kind of the mainstream world. Future Rave feels like it's purely for the ravers. Yeah, absolutely. This is my response to this feeling of frustration I had uh, when I felt like EDM went to a place that I didn't like anymore, mm -hmm. but I was kind of the face of it. So how do I deal with that? So first I do Jackback, but I realized that when I play Jackback in uh, one of my big shows, it doesn't really work because... Uh, you know, I'm playing for 100,000 people. The energy is, is this, this is house music. It's made for clubs. So then uh, I came with this concept together with my friend Morton of Future Rave, which was making something fresh and new, but that had enough energy to work in a festival. Mm. And then I'm going back to you know, Chemical Brothers and Prodigy and, and uh, all this type of crazy rave music, but with also a techno influence. At the same time, I have my friends from Televerse that they, they're doing the melodic techno and it's it's starting to bubble. And, and I'm like, I love this, you know, but because I play big shows, I still want that that big sound you can find in EDM. And this is the transition where I kind of go out of EDM and, and I have my solution. Because I realize that every time I play Future Rave, I'm killing it in those festivals. And, um, and lucky enough, uh, I did a few sessions with Ray. We became extremely good friends. We... We had later, we had a big record with Bed, yes, uh, uh, with Joel Curry, but we did Future Rave together, like uh, it's not so known. Uh, but we have this record that I feel is absolutely gorgeous and it's called Make It to Heaven. And we wrote this in my studio at home in Ibiza probably something like six in the morning, uh, you know, partying. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it's it's a very beautiful record, I feel. We have to talk about the fact that, you know, congratulations once again. DJ Magazine, number one DJ in the world again. How does it feel knowing that you've done that so many times and it's voted for by the people? First, it feels amazing for the reason you just mentioned, that it's voted by the people the same way this year I, I, I won producer of the year at the 1001 track list. You know, yes. this is data based. So this is like, okay, what are the records that have been played the most by DJs? You know, this is not what a writer uh, feels uh, uh, about what should be cool. You know, this is facts. So, this is very important. Also, funny enough for DJ Mag, I realized that every time I won was for a different reason. And I'm always trying to be anal analytic for why am I winning? Because last year I didn't win. So the first time was probably because of that crossover becoming, you know, like so massive and being Googled more than any other DJ mm. probably ever at that time. <laughs> uh, and, and I got a fitting and Sexy Chick and all those records. Um, lots of hates, but still winning. And then later, I came with Future Rave and I think people um, during COVID saw how I was real and dedicated to the scene because we just started Future Rave with Morton right before COVID. I didn't want to let down the fans because there was so much excitement. And, you know, it was a, almost suicidal to release rave music 
when there was no festivals. Mm -hmm. And I still did it. And I think the fans, the core fans, not necessarily mine, but the scene appreciated it because I was doing it for them. And maybe they didn't see me like this before because they knew me for those big crossover records and I was seen as more commercial. And then I, they see that I do something that is really for our community. And this year, funny enough, I think I won because of I'm good, because of Baby Don't Hurt Me. Yeah. Um, I went into a cycle of sampling for the first time in my career because um, I'm probably the DJ that is sampling the least. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but now, I would like, there was this record that I made four to five years ago uh, with BB and we never released, but I played it in a show and a girl sampled it and used it as a sound for TikTok and it became a huge hit. So I have this message from BB. Yo, you know what's happening with I'm Good? I'm like, no, what it? And then she shows me the numbers on, on TikTok. Huge. And she says like, we need to put this record out. Mm -hmm. Like now. So because the record was four years old and I made only a festival version, I had to produce it like within a week, <laughs> uh, put it out. And then I was so shocked. Mm. I remember playing, it was a festival actually in the UK. I, I think it was Creamfield. Creamfield. And I'm playing this before the record is released, two days before the release of the record and everyone is singing the song. And I was in such a shock to, to because of course, this is me discovering the power of social media, you know, like, wow. I have a hit record even before it's released. Crazy. And and from that, it's again, you know, a big change in my career. Uh, sampling Eurodance, which is a type of music I would never have played at the time. No, you are a house kid at the time. Exactly. By growing older, I look at music in a very different way now. Mm. And I listen to the power of melodies and chord progressions. And those melodies are undeniable. It was just maybe the production style that I was not a big fan of. And it was too fast and the type of kicks they were using. And It was Belgian. You, know, you were French. I can understand. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like a different culture. Yeah. And, and, but at the same time, musically, it was genius. Yeah. So, so from that fun... I think probably because I'm good also was like using a famous melody but with proper lyrics that were expressing a feeling that is so simple. A little bit like I got a feeling. We come with a record saying, you know, something so positive, I got a feeling and we're going to have a good night tonight. Something so simple and feel good and positive, just forget about your problems. And same with I'm good. Mm. You know, we're coming out of, you know, like the craziness of COVID and, and we have, I'm good, very easy. You want to, you want to say that you're happy and you're feeling good. You want to pose this in three seconds, everyone understand the feeling. And I think this is the, the reason of, of being so successful. And, and, and again, a new cycle for me in my life, um, back after future rave being so big for me as a DJ back to being so pop again, when I was not even trying to do that anymore. No. And, and it's, it's very interesting because I had this difficult moment that I was telling you about when EDM was so massive, but I didn't feel right in that movement anymore. And I didn't know what to play. I was scared to lose my you know, um, status. And it was such a negative moment in my life. And then doing uh, Jack Back and doing uh, Future Rave was incredible because I was like, okay, I'm able to make music that DJs connect with and I don't care if it's not a commercial success. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel like a failure. And, and when I'm deciding not to do commercial anymore, 
there's this the biggest record of my entire career. Huge commercial record. You know, like nominated for two Grammys for no, that and Baby crazy. Don't Hurt Me. It's just crazy. Like I'm good. It, it is bigger. Is going to be bigger than any of my records from before. So so. And it's a record we did for fun in a, in, a, in, a, in you know in a couple of hours you know so I never expected this so um, this again was a very big turning point. It's only right that we talk about what's happening next for you because yes. this record that you've got big with Ira Star this feels like it could be the next wave for you. So you know very interesting that you know only probably in your show I can do the whole story like this is that right now I'm having two records. I'm, I'm having When We Were Young uh, with Kim Petras, and that is a little bit of that sample yeah. wave that I'm talking about. And I have Big, and this is um, with Aria Star. She's like a, a you know Afrobeat superstar. She's exploding right now. And uh, um, Lil Durk, uh, hip-hop superstar, and to make this record, I really went back to the uh, the original Chicago house sound, and it's funny because we started the show talking about <laughs> this my my very original, you know, acid house and deep house influences, and you know the chords that I'm playing on that record, they 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 they're from that time. The bass line is different. But uh, um, and and the drums too, but uh, I thought it was interesting when I saw what Drake did last time, uh, going a little bit in that Chicago area. And again, I'm like, I know this music like very very well, you know. <laughs> so so we were jamming um, uh, in LA, and um, we wrote that record, and then I met with Aria Star. Uh, we recorded the record. And she killed it. And this is a little bit of a homage to, uh, you know, the original uh, house music sound. So this is, it's, I think it's perfect to close the show yeah. with a record that is actually what I'm doing right now, but from the roots that I mentioned when I started to DJ and play house music in 88. The only thing that's missing from this record is in the beginning there was Jack. <laughs> Listen, this guy, this guy's reach reach out for me. Really? Yes, absolutely. I got excited. Wow. Yes, <laughs> yes. He, I received a, I think a DM, uh, 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 and I was like, "What? <laughs> this is, you know, it almost feel, this a cappella is so anthemic and like it almost feel like it's not a real person, yeah. you know." And then. You know, I'm this guy. I'm like, wow, incredible. <laughs> so maybe we could see a collaboration at some yeah, point in the future. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be amazing. David, we've run out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the music. Yeah, th this was really incredible because it's very rare that I can speak about my whole journey. Very rare. It takes time and also it takes passionate people uh, for, for our music. David, it's been a privilege having you on the show. Thank you so much, man. 